We had a little bit of a hiatus here, but we are back and better than ever. Welcome to another edition of the Let's Debate podcast powered by Delahanty Media. I'm Nick Delahanty. In case you forgot, it's been two weeks, Kyle. I don't know if they remember us. I would hope they remember us. I mean, you're tuning in. So uh, first off, we want to thank you guys for tuning in and welcome back to Let's Debate podcast. We have a lot to cover. We did we did take a week off, but you know the positive from that is that there's there's more to cover. We have a lot of sports that wrapped up, um, and then we have our sports that are continuing. So um, you know before we jump into that, obviously I know if you're watching right now or you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, YouTube, whichever one, you can see the screen. But for those of you that are listening to the audio, remember if you want to check out our previous episodes, you can always head over to our website delhantymedia.com. We have our shop on there as well. And head over to our uh, social media. You can find us on Instagram at Delahanty Media, Facebook Let's Debate Podcast, and Twitter at Let's Debate Pod. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of sports to cover, so we're gonna hand it back over to Nick and uh, let's get this thing rolling. Yeah, we got a lot to cover, and also we have a lot of ways for you to listen to our show. So there's no excuses for you not to listen to the show, your friends to not listen to the show, your family members, anybody. Make them tune in, especially for our live show uh, that we recorded. Ahead of time, make sure you comment in and provide some feedback on what you're thinking about the different topics that we are discussing. Let's get right into it. And I think that the only fitting way to start the show is to talk about your guy, LeBron James, bringing home another NBA championship. They defeated the Miami Heat in six games. In like me and you have said, it didn't necessarily feel like the NBA Finals, but you can't take anything away because, number one, the NBA did a fantastic job with the um, covid kind of protection of these guys and getting the season rolling and they had basketball that's I think the biggest thing the Lakers were clearly the better team in my mind you know and I said it to you I I didn't watch much of the finals because I was just under that impression that the Lakers were going to win it you know there was no draw for me like back when the Warriors took on LeBron when you had uh, Curry and Durant and those guys going against LeBron I felt like the Heat were a, a good opponent but I just felt like they were overmatched yeah, I'm gl- well, I'm glad the first thing you mentioned was the, the whole COVID situation because we both kind of uh, applauded the NHL when they wrapped up on how they handled the whole situation. you got to say the same for the NBA. There wasn't a single positive test. I mean, that that's impressive, and, and that's all because of the bubble because we're seeing what's going on with the NFL right now, and there's whether it's players, coaches, personnel, it's even happening in college. The whole bubble approach, I know it would be difficult for the NFL. The bubble approach was the right way to go, and uh, – both, both those leagues proved it. But as for the NBA Finals, I mean, yeah, I had the uh, the Lakers win the Finals since the start of the season. Uh, Nick knows, and if you guys have been watching these episodes, you all know I'm a big uh, LeBron fan. So I was happy to see that. But like Nick mentioned, it didn't feel like the NBA Finals. I mean, you can't take anything away from these guys. They still went out there. They put the best teams in the bubble. You still had to go through all your playoff series and, you know, being away from your family and, and – and everything like that. It was not an easy road for any of these guys. So you got to give credit where credit's due. Uh, but, you know, I'm just hoping that in the near future, we're able to get some fans in the stands and bring that NBA feel back because I did miss that, that typical NBA finals feel where you feel like they're under, you know, the bright lights and, and the crowd really gets into it. But overall, I, I tuned into some games. And also I felt that the Lakers had it before the series started. Like Nick mentioned, it just, if there was another team in there, maybe it would have been up in the air, someone like like the Bucks, but the Heat, they had a good season. Like I mentioned, you got to give credit where credit's due. They had a great season, and uh, they surprised a lot of people, but the Lakers were a better team all around. Yeah, without a doubt. The Heat are a young, a very fun, energetic team. They have a great coach in Eric Spolster. I think he deserves a lot of credit because, you know, a lot of people said he won his titles because he had LeBron and Wade and those guys, but he proved he can get back to the finals, and, you know, as much as we discredit the Eastern Conference, they had to go through some pretty tough teams to get there, especially with this situation. It wasn't like you had a continuous feel. You were playing games at home and things like that. The whole bubble situation played a factor. And, you know, it has an impact. Now, I want to get into LeBron because obviously that's the big center of attention in, in this series and, and obviously he brings home another MVP award. And he what title number four for him? out of, what, 10 appearances in the finals, if I'm correct? I, I might be wrong with yeah. those numbers. What did you think about LeBron's statement at the end of the game where he basically was, I don't want to say crying, but he was calling for his respect? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, we, well, first off, if you haven't gotten a chance uh, to our viewers, if you haven't gotten a chance to check out 
Nick and I's episode. I think I believe it's our second episode ever. You could go back on DelahantyMedia.com, check it out. We debate who the GOAT is. For those of you who have seen it, you know that I am in favor of LeBron and Nick's in favor of MJ. So I do think LeBron's a GOAT, but I look at it from both sides. I think MJ deserves his GOAT status because of what he did. Three, uh, three Pete retires for two years, or I should say leaves the game. <laughs> comes back and three-peat again in the same city with the same coach. That's impressive, right? He dominated an entire decade. Well, I think on the other side of it is what LeBron's done is impressive too. You know, four titles, three different cities, three different organizations, three different head coaches, three different supporting cast. That's not easy to do. And when you're winning the title at 25, 26, and still dominating at 35 and carrying this team, that's impressive. So I think they both deserve credit there. I do think people aren't going to really truly appreciate LeBron until he's gone, like once he retires. And I I truly do believe that whether you're a LeBron hater or you're not, um, I really do believe that. And I've been saying that for years, but I wasn't really a fan of him, you know, basically crying for his respect because I think it was Skip Bayless made a good point. He said, Michael Jordan never had to do that because people never doubted that he was the goat. And I still think LeBron's the goat, but I think he should approach it differently. And I think what Skip Bayless said, if that was him, I mean, that made me sit back and think like, wow, that's a great point that he made. What do you think? See, I'm bringing it up because I had I had my own thought process on it, too. And and like you said, I, I firmly believe that Jordan's the greatest of all time. And I thought that LeBron, you know, as much as people discredit him and, you know, try to bash him, I, I do respect him as a player. I'm not like Paul Pierce where I'm going to say he's out of the top ten. That's just ridiculous. Yeah. I'm in that predicament where – He's a top five player in in the game in the history, regardless of where you put him, right? Winning a title with the Lakers, I think, solidified him as a top three player in the game, in in the history of the game, that is. But when I heard that comment from him at the end of the game, I just felt like he gave people motivation to not consider him on that level of a Jordan and a maybe even put a Kobe Bryant in there, you know, because of what he did with the Lakers. You, he basically gave everybody that reason, like he's still chasing Jordan. When, if he would have just avoided saying that, I think it would have been a lot better than what he did actually say it. First and foremost, I respect LeBron. You know, I might not agree that he's the greatest ever to play the game, but I respect what he does. Watching him play at 35 years old, like you said, is incredible. There's nobody who's who's done it like that at that level. There's in any sport. You know, you could look at Tom Brady, maybe, but what. What LeBron's doing is double of what Brady has ever done at his his older age. Now, I just feel like that whole statement there that, oh, I want my respect, it just threw everybody more fuel to the fire where everybody was in awe of what he did and and everybody on social media, you saw it, was like he's closed the gap on Jordan. Winning in L.A. was something big. But I just feel like that comment just threw everything off and I'm like, LeBron, why did you do that? Like, you just solidified yourself lower when you should be setting yourself at a higher standard. And I know that it's probably frustrating that people hate on him and and whatnot and they don't appreciate him. But like you said, I think he's one of those guys that you're not going to truly appreciate until he officially hangs it up for good. Yeah, I think it's going to hit maybe 10, 20 years from now when they have the documentary about him and basically his road. Because you know that's coming. And that's going to be a great story because I don't think we've ever seen a player like that. The hype that he had in high school. And I feel like he surpassed those expectations and what he's done. It's still doing in the 35. But my question for you now is knowing that the Lakers have this core of guys, and I guess the core of guys is LeBron and AD because they're going to extend AD. There's no doubt in my mind about that. They pretty much confirmed it too. Do you think they still have enough in the tank to win a title next year or maybe the year after? Or do you think they're done? Do you think this is a one-time thing for them? They'll compete, but they won't really get there again. That's a great question. That that really is because you have to look at it too. How much are these teams going to spend in free agency this year because of the whole COVID impact? You know, you look at these teams, they've lost a lot of money. Let's let's call a spade a spade. Maybe not as much as, say, a, a baseball or somebody who had a whole season without fans, but they have lost their revenue. You know, are there going to be big moves in this offseason? How the free agent class, you know, there's not really much about the free agent class. You hear more about Giannis in 2021 than you do anything now. And the NBA draft, like, what are these teams going to get from these players? I think next year, they're legitimate contenders. I really do. I think that the next year's the final year of that. And, and if they're smart, 
how they extend Davis is you give him a two-year deal with an opt-out after the third. And what you basically say is you, you try to compete these next two years with LeBron. You see how it goes. And then moving forward, Davis can decide, you know, maybe I want to go elsewhere. Maybe, you know, we won another title and I have nothing else to prove here. But then you have that ability to add more players. Do I think that if they keep the same Lakers roster, they win it? No. I absolutely not. I think that they're a little too weak. I think that the the break in the season was a, a great gift for LeBron because let's face it, at 35 years old, you're getting a little break from the game and and it's not as grueling of a schedule as, you know, you would anticipate. So, I think they're contenders. I think that you could even put them in the predicament of being finals contenders next year. It's the year after that scares me. Yeah, I think the two-year, I think you said two-year deal with the the third year being an opt-out if he wants it. I think that's pretty good for AD because who knows two or three years down the line from now, what's LeBron going to be like? And not any doubt in LeBron because people have been saying this for years. He's going to slow down. He's going to slow down. So who knows? At 37, 38 years old, he still might be going. But you don't really want to sign that huge deal, even though L.A. is a nice place to be. I mean, the Lakers have always been, you know, a big free agent. You know, they, they keep an eye over there. But the long-term deal for him might not be in his best interest. And, you know, once that two- or three-year contract runs out, you could always extend more if you want. Um, and then I, I'm not saying that you're uh, discrediting LeBron in any type of way, but you mentioned the whole, like, the break in the season at 35 years old, right? I have seen people on social media saying that, oh, well, this break helped him and this and that. Okay, so it helped a 35-year-old, but, like, it had no effect on the 23-year-olds, the 25-year-olds. Like, And I'm not saying you're making this excuse, but I've seen people on social media, like, trash LeBron saying, the only reason he won is because they had a break in the season. He got lucky. Come on. Like, that's just a dumb thing to even say because he's 35. Yes, the break could have helped him, but these other guys didn't even need a break, and they he still beat them. So it's just... I had to throw that in there um, just because the people on social media are crazy. I mean, listen, LeBron averaged almost almost 30 points in this series, 11 rebounds, 8 assists. It's greatness. Like It's literally greatness, and it, and people aren't going to appreciate it until it's, it's over. And, and you know what? The people on social media get me, too, because it, it makes me laugh. You know, they find any which way to discredit things. They'll, they'll say his, you know, they'll, they'll make something up about LeBron before they give him credit. I, with or without it, the guy was dominating. Like, give him his credit. Like, not you, obviously, but everybody on social media. Like, yeah. well, the guy dominated, whether he had a break or not. Like you said, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying like you said about the uh, the people saying that it like only benefited him because obviously it helped everybody. But for a guy like him, you mean to tell me that didn't give him fresh legs? Like, that was like a blessing oh, yeah. for like a guy like him. And you know what? He took advantage of it. Like, good for him, bro. Like, if I was in that situation, I had a couple of weeks to rest up. He came out fresh. Like, he didn't miss a beat. Like, it wasn't like he struggled early on. He came out and he dominated. So, you know, everybody had the same playing field. It wasn't like they said, oh, the Lakers get three right. weeks off. <laughs> it wasn't. That wasn't the case. It was everybody. Literally. It, and I think, I think they have a, a great chance of competing next year. There's not a doubt in my mind. Um, you just got to keep an eye on a team like the Warriors, right? They're going to be fully healthy, and we know what they've done when they're healthy, with KD or, or without KD, and they're going to have the second pick in the draft. So who knows what they do with that? Do they draft one of those young guys, or do they trade that away for more ammunition? Um, you look on the, in the East, you look at the Nets. I mean, they're going to have Kyrie and KD. We have no idea what that duo is going to do yet, and there's a good chance they get to the finals. And then once you're in the finals, it's it's game on. So – um, I think the Lakers have a great shot next year, but the league's obviously going to change. The landscape's going to change a bit where players go here and there. Um, Giannis is obviously what everyone's focused on. But aside from that, I mean, I don't think the free agency class is that great coming into this year. Uh, I think, like, the big name I keep hearing is DeMar DeRozan. He's not going to be looked at as, you know, your number one. You might want to bring him in as a number two or number three, but I'm not sure he gets you over that hump to a final. So, a lot, and like you said, with, with the money involved with COVID, I mean, a lot of these teams might stay put. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out over time, too. Yeah, and if you discredit the Lakers, for anybody watching, as being finals contenders next year with AD, who's arguably one of the better players in the world right now, and LeBron, who, you know, until he starts to slow down, you have to credit him as the best player out there. They have a great duel that could definitely lead them. Now, we've had a couple of head coaching changes. So we had Steve Nash take over in Brooklyn. You have Doc Rivers taking over in Philly. And you have Tyron Lue, who was recently named the Clippers head coach. Now, of those three guys that I mentioned, which one do you think has the best chance to succeed right away and why? That's tough. Um, 
I, you know, I think it's Tyron Lue, um, mainly because, I mean, I don't know if you can really credit him so much for those three finals appearances. It's, it seems like LeBron takes any coach to the finals, but he's also taken over a good team, a uh, team that obviously, you know, proved that they're a nice team this year, make it to, making it to the semifinals. And they had, you know, they were title favorites for most of the season. I think the situation with Doc and Philly, obviously Doc is good, but Doc's had better teams than Philly, and he's choked, and he hasn't gotten there. And that's not a that's not an easy group to coach over there. Embiid has his own issues. Simmons has his issues. And then you look at Steve Nash, and it's hard to really have a take on Steve Nash because he has no head coaching experience. And as a Nets fan, I'm not too thrilled with Kyrie and KD already coming out saying that it's a team effort and that the coach doesn't really have the final say. I mean, I don't – I'm paraphrasing here, but they said something along those lines. And uh, I would be a little annoyed by that if I'm Steve Nash, because they're pretty much just moving you out of the way saying you could, you could be on the the sideline, but you're not the coach. So um, I don't know if he's going to have an easy job over there either. I'm hoping it all goes well as a fan of them, but I think uh, Tyron Lou probably has the best shot of succeeding over there. What do you think? I'm going to go with Nash. I, because number one, I don't buy into the Sixers. I don't buy it unless they make some kind of roster moves or something. Get rid of either Simmons or Embiid. I don't buy into them. And now most NBA draft mocks have them taking Cole Anthony out of the University of North Carolina. So you're adding another non-shot creator into the mix at, in Philadelphia. It just makes it, it's amazing to me. Uh, but again, <laughs> he he will never gel in that organization. I don't understand what that whole deal is. But when you look at roster and you look at the conference, the Nets have a really nice roster. And if they could add a couple more pieces, Nash could be in a position where they don't need him to coach. You know, they could have a they could have a team where you're going to win games by having some of the best players on the floor. And I think personally, I think that Paul George gets traded. I don't think that the Clippers are going to hold on to him. He's got that opt out after the year. I think that they're under the impression that he's not going to stay. He's going to go and get his money, especially that the draft class, not not the draft class, the free agent class after Giannis is kind of, you know, there. He can make some big money on the open market. So I think they're going to trade him. I think that somebody like the Knicks are going to try to overpay for him, give him an R.J. Barrett or a Kevin Knox or somebody like that. And I just think that Lou's going to be like, okay, what did you set me up with here? I had a, I had a great team that could compete. Now I have this. So... I, I would say Nash, and I would say Lou, and then finally I would say Rivers, because like you said, I don't really buy into Rivers. He has the NBA title with the Celtics, but he has that, that choke gene that you uh, mentioned. Yeah, I mean, listen, I do want to say Nash. I want to say that because we haven't seen we haven't seen him yet, and that's what was the tough part about choosing that. But he does. they do have a nice roster, and everyone does. All they do is talk about Kyrie and KD, like I mentioned before, but... They do have a, they have a lot of talent, and you could also use those pieces to, to trade and, and probably grab a, a big number three. I mean, there's been the rumors of Bradley Beal. I'm not sure if that helps them or hurts them. I mean, that's a decision that the front office has to make. But the Doc Rivers situation, I think they made that move because it was a splashy pick. He It was probably the biggest name or, let's say, the best name on the market, and they went and grabbed that because they've been dealing with garbage for so long. They want to try to get over that hump. I mean, you have Simmons, you have Embiid. They do have a nice roster as well. They just, like, cannot get over this hump. Like, they can't even get to the conference finals. And there's really no excuse for them to not be there. So, um, yeah, I think I would like to go with Nash, and I, I want him to, to be the best one. I think he's going to be solid. I think he can help out Kyrie. Um, he obviously has a great basketball IQ. So I think he's setting up this team nicely. Um I'm looking forward to it. I mean, it's it's nice to see Nets basketball back uh, to to contending because it's been a while. It really has been. And before we we jump topics here, give me a rating one to ten on the new alternate jerseys. I don't know if you guys have seen them. I know I know we talked about it, but what's the rating on that? I gotta go ten. I think the, the Nets have been doing a nice job with the jerseys. I mean, even just the move to Brooklyn with those gray jerseys, I think they're sick. Uh, they've done a really nice job with the court. Remember, it was like gray at some point. I mean, I, I'm I'm into it. I think the front office is, is making a lot of nice moves with the players, with um, how the jerseys are coming out, with the court. They're really changing things up. It's, it's kind of been flat. I feel like it was pretty flat. Once they made the move to Brooklyn, it was like this big thing. Then they went flat. Now it's kind of it's getting up there again. And I think they, they're doing this because they know when you bring in guys like Kyrie, you bring in guys like KD, you're going to put fans in the seats. So if you're putting out these nice jerseys, people are going to buy them, and you're bringing in more, more money for your organization. So it's smart on their part. What do you think? 
I, considering that I have a Durant one on the way already, I have to give it like a 20 out of 10 here. Uh, when I got the email about it, first of all, I love those old throwbacks from the East Rutherford days at the Continental Arena and the Petrovich days and all those guys. So when I saw that, I was like, I got to jump in. I got the player t-shirt. It's actually on its way, so I should have it within the next couple of days. I'll have to wear it next show. But I just I love them. I think it's great they're embracing the history. You know, Obviously, we're not going to see them wear New Jersey across their chest. I would love to have those 2,000 throwbacks and – you know, the, those are. I think they should do that, though. They, I think they should bring like a game or two back, like you know, a, a jersey every once in a while, where they're wearing those like the 2002, 2003 team jerseys with the white, um, the blue, or the gray, and even the red ones that they wore kind of towards the end of uh, like early 2010s, right before they went to Brooklyn. They should do that. I mean, I don't know. I, it would be cool to get a Durant jersey in one of those or a Kyrie jersey in one of those i'd be up for it i would i would buy durant i would buy irving and i would buy a throwback jason kidd if i could kenyon martin i oh, yeah. you know growing up those were the guys we watched you would love to see that yeah. i don't know if they would ever do the jersey in front of it the new jersey on the front because most of them have that but you know it be, would be something interesting to uh kind of take a look at now speaking of jason kidd he just won a title with the Lakers. he did he very yeah, much so did congratulations to he's a, he was a great point guard and he's a great coach i think he got a uh I don't think he got a fair shake as a head coach. You know, I, I know he had struggles and everything, but I think that as an assistant, he's a really good coach. And, you know, that's a guy that somebody like LeBron can look up to in terms of, like, playing later in your career. Like, kid played till what, till he was 38, 39 years old? He was up there in age. Oh, yeah. You know, maybe he gives him tips about how to keep your body, like, in shape. And, and, you know, LeBron obviously is a health freak. Like, you see his body. The guy looks like he's 25 years old. But, you know, maybe any little tip or guidance can help down the road. Yeah, and I think he helps out. Not saying that Rondo need, needs much help, but he's definitely helping out Rondo getting up there in age because Rondo had a great finals. Great finals. No one's talking about Ray on Rondo. He played great in the finals. So, um, yeah, shout out to Jason Kidd. I know you mentioned him. I had to throw it in there that he won the championship. Oh, yeah. And while you mentioned Rondo, the only player in NBA history to win a title with both the Celtics and the Lakers. How cool is that? Yeah, and he beat the Lakers the first time. For so it's kind of weird. He has like this weird... There, there's some connection with Rondo in both these franchises. Listen, the guy's been a winner, and he's been a good point guard for many, many years, and we expect it to continue. Now, Major League Baseball, as we switch topics, I, you shook your head already because we already got <laughs> to that point. Um, since we last talked, uh, the New York Yankees lost to the Tampa Bay Rays in a five-game series in the American League Division Series. A lot of questionable decisions in that series and, and another, yeah, heartbreaking loss for the Yankees. Yeah, it's just – I shook my head because it's just, like, disappointing at this point. You know, you, you look at the roster that they have. You look at the expectations that fans and just the, around the league they have for them. I just feel like they're starting to choke at this point. And you mentioned decisions. I'm not a, I'm not a Boone fan. I didn't really like the hire to begin with. I think he's made a lot of questionable decisions. And there's rumors going out there. I don't know if they're true or not that Cash made that decision about Garcia in game two. I don't know who made that decision, but it was a bad decision. I think I could have put a six-year-old out there who could have made a better decision. I swear to God, I don't know how you decide to put half in over him. <laughs> what has Hap ever done to for you to have any confidence in him going into that type of game? It's just disappointing. Um, I do want to mention this, though. You look at the 2017, 2017 season, and there weren't high expectations for that team, right? And they shocked the world. They got to Game 7 of the ALCS. So we go into the next year, we get Stan. The expectations are even higher now. We're actually looking at it like, man, we could get over that hump. We might get to the World Series. They lose in a round prior to the one that they lost in the year before. They lost in the ALDS this year to Boston. Then last year, LeMayu hits that game-tying home run in game six, top of the ninth. Chapman gives up the walk-off in the, the following inning. And then this year, we lost in the ALDS again on a walk-off by Chapman. It's like the excuses are gone now. The excuses were, oh, we need the pitching. And, oh, our team needs to get healthy. So I don't know what they're going to do, but they need to make some decisions this offseason. Um, I know we're probably going to get to that in a little bit, but I had to get that off my, my, my chest. It, it annoyed me losing the, to Houston and Boston those three years. It actually didn't annoy me losing to, to Tampa because, like, I actually have a lot of respect for Tampa. You know, they're, they don't have a big payroll. They're not a big market team. They're a bunch of guys that are hungry. And they're well coached and they have a good rotation. 
I want them to go win the World Series. I want them to beat Houston in the ALCS, and I want them to go win the World Series. I don't really have that hatred towards them because they completely outplayed us all year. <laughs> you're you're 100% right about the Rays. Number one, they're well coached. Kevin Cash, whether you like him or hate him, I know the whole situation with Chapman during the regular season. You know, Kevin Cash is the top five manager in this game, whether you like it or not. And he, the guy's amazing. They have a team full of no names, like you said. You, you could probably name three or four starters on their team if you watch like regular baseball. But they get the job done. They're not going to kill you offensively. They're not going to put up 15 to 16 runs a night. They're going to do the little things right. And they cater on three things. Good starting pitching, great bullpen, and even better defense. And that's what the Yankees don't have. The Yankees don't have the defense. The bullpen shut down. And the starting pitching was not there. Now, you mentioned Garcia and the Hap situation. And I understand the logic behind it. I understand what they were trying to do with the opener, but there was no way that I was giving the ball to Garcia to go one inning. Before that game, and I, I said it to a couple of people I was talking to about the game, I wanted to see Garcia go through the lineup one time. I wanted to see him face nine batters and then see how he was doing. If he was doing well, you go batter by batter, inning by inning, and you, and you see how he does. You know, 21 years old, you see what the kid can do. I would have never... Never put Jay Happ in, even though they say that they wanted to have the left-handed hitting lineup against him and help with the matchups and force Cash to, to alter his hand. The numbers were the same for him and Garcia against lefties this year. I don't know what the big difference was. And you just put Happ in a predicament where he's pitching in a role he's not confident in. He clearly told Aaron Boone this wasn't something he was okay with. And then, you know, you throw him out there, the guy stinks, and you just leave him out there. They basically punted game two, and I think if you look at a turning point in this series, that was it. Cole was dominant in game one. He was dominant in game five. The the 30 plus million dollars you paid him this year, it was well worth it. Obviously that. But other than him, the rotation suspect, Tanaka didn't have it. He got hurt by a couple of bad calls by umpiring. And, you know, as much as you want to get into umpiring, they did impact the game. You had the Luke Voigt at bat where he should have walked with the bases loaded with Stanton on deck. Remember, Stanton was the hottest Yankee hitter at the time. And he ends up grounding out because he has to swing at a bad pitch on 3-2. And then Tanaka has to strike him out, throw him out. Not cold. They, now it's first and second. Kiermaier comes up, hits a home run. So it did dictate the series. But in the same token, you got to play better. you got to pitch better. It's, it's just frustrating. And like you said, Chapman, and, and this is something that you know I've thought about a lot lately. 2020 has had karma on so many people and so many things, right? Chapman got his karma for the regular season. It was karma. Think about this, right? He throws at Brousseau for no apparent reason. And I'm sorry if I if I messed his name up because, you know, the kid's actually not a bad ball player. Throws at him for no reason. Gets suspended, doesn't have to serve the suspension. But then he meets up with him again in the postseason. And what happens? He lets up the home run to win the game, to lose the game for the Yankees. So, you know, I just feel that was karma. Like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, karma really hit the Yankees. They should just let him sus get suspended and, and serve the three games, like, at that point. But, like you said, very disappointing. It just seems like they need to make m a lot of changes this offseason because it's not working. It's like the definition of insanity. Like, they keep throwing out the same team thinking it's going to change, but it's not. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at their their playoff performance, and... It's crazy to say this, but game two of that series, the moment they took Garcia out, I feel like we we still were up a game. We had this whole game two to go, and I was like, that's the series. I just I knew Hap was done. I looked at the rest of the, Ray, the Rays rotation, the rest of the series. I looked at the rest of our rotation. I was like, we're in trouble. And, um, you know, the rotation this year was was disappointing. You know, we, we had all this talk for how long about all we need is our ace. And, and Cole did his part. Cole has been worth every cent we've given him thus far. And uh, thank God we got him because what kind of shape would we be in without him? But they need to make some some moves here. I, I really don't want Tanaka back. Listen, the guy did his part on our team. Um, I, I always liked Tanaka, but I never was fully confident in him. I always thought he was inconsistent. He stepped up in the playoffs, um, and that's when I really looked at him. I, there were games where we were out of it early with him. There were the times where he, he'd go like seven strong, and you're like, man, he's on today. Um, along with that, I felt like the moment they put happen right after that, we just went flat. The team just went flat. It didn't feel like the same series. We were on a roll. We, we destroyed Cleveland in two games. We destroyed Tampa in that first game. And 
it's just disappointing at this point. I feel like every year we have these high expectations for the team. They make certain moves, and you're like, this is the year. This is the year. There's all this talk about how we lost to Houston last year, and they cheated, and this and that, and now we got their stud pitcher. They're still further. They still got farther than us. I mean, there's just no excuses anymore. And I understand. Listen, if Tampa beats Houston, if they knock them out of the playoffs, then, yeah, you can make the same case. Well, if, if Tampa versus um, – if Houston versus Tampa, when the Yankees did, they would have been out around earlier too, right? But, I mean, we, we can't decide the matchups there. But the Yankees got out earlier than Houston. And with all this cheating and stuff, Houston looks better than the Yankees. Their bats look better than the Yankees, in my opinion, right now. Um, they're putting up a better fight against Tampa than we did. I mean, Correa just hit that walk off uh, last night. But, yeah, they need to make some changes. Um, a, a move I would like to see them make, and, and I think it works out for them. Trevor Bauer said that he, he basically is up for coming to New York. He likes those short, uh, you know, he doesn't like long-term deals. He likes short-term deals. Give him like two years, mega bucks to come and be the number two behind Cole. I mean, they have to make other moves too, but I'm all for that because, listen, you're not going to have to knock on the payroll anymore. I have no idea what's going to go on with Paxton. We're going to get Severino back. Hopefully he comes back the way that he did. He's coming back from injury. We have no idea about that yet. But we, ha- we know Cole could do his part. He wasn't phased by the New York media at all. And I know, listen, he didn't play in front of our fans and this and that, but the guy's been cold-blooded his entire career. I don't – I literally – cold-blooded, not cold. <laughs> it's an E at the end, not a D. But um, he's been great. So why not bring in Bauer? And, and you're convincing Bauer to be like, listen, man, we're trying to get to a World Series. We know you're trying to get to a World Series because you've been so close throughout your career. You don't have the pressure of being a number one. You pitched great last year. You don't like long, long-term long deals. Here's a short-term deal, and you're going to get your money. I, I think Cashman needs to make that move. He needs to do something because you cannot go into this, this offseason and, and put out a worse roster next year or not make the necessary moves. And I want LeMay you signed right now. You can do it tomorrow. Give him the blank check. Whatever he wants, you give it to him because he's the best player we got. He's the best player on the team, in my opinion. It's hands down. It's not even close, besides Cole. Now, as much as I want Trevor Bauer, too, and if you follow me on Twitter, you guys could see I tweet the guy almost every day. Like, I try to be friends with this guy to get him to come to New York. The scary thing to me is listening to the Yankees talk about how much money they lost and how they want to keep under the, the luxury tax threshold of $210 million. With that being said, I think that we're in for an offseason of what we call New York Yankees bargain shopping. And what's going to happen with that is, I think that if I'm making a bold prediction, I think Tanaka goes back to Japan. I think that they're going to pay him close to 25 to $30 million to come back and be the, you know, the guy that's going to sell seats in, in Japan. And I think that if he's not with the Yankees, he's either going to the West Coast or he's going to go to Japan. Now, I would say the Angels might be a good, a good fit. They might overpay him. They need some pitching. Now, I think that LeMahieu resigns. I think that they're smart enough to bring him back. The one thing I'm afraid of is that they're going to resign him with the intent of trading Voight to move LeMahieu to first base. I think that's a dumb idea. I love that LeMahieu's an elite second baseman. I don't want to move him. Unless you're going to tell me that you're going to get a shortstop that's capable of being defensively sound and not have Glaber there every day, then, then maybe I'll consider it. But I would sell high on Voight, but I would bring in another first baseman. I really would. I think that as much as I love Luke Voigt, I think he's a one-hit wonder type of deal. I don't think he ever yeah. duplicates that. Uh, I would sell high when I can and get something for him, whether it's pitching or something like that. And again, I, I don't think they make many big moves. Maybe they bring in a shortstop, uh, a, a low barrel shortstop. You know, uh, and Reynolds uh, Simmons from the he, he was with the Angels for a while there. Simmons or yeah. Crawford. Crawford's actually related to Garrett Cole. Maybe the Giants want to trade his contract. He's got one year, like 11 or $12 million left. Just for a one-year gap, because look at next year. You have Lindor, Correa, Baez. All those guys are free agents, so maybe you can kind of dive into one of those and, and add them as your long-term term shortstop. But for the time being, I think you're going to see little moves. I think they move on from Gary Sanchez. I think they move on from Luke Voigt. I think they finally have the sense to move on from Brett Gardner, even though he had a really nice postseason. No discredit to him. And if you're making a bold prediction, I think that maybe Urshela gets traded too. I think they see the metrics. Yeah, he looks really good defensively when you watch him. But if you look at the metrics, he doesn't rate as a top third baseman. It's just how the metrics are. He doesn't cover a lot of ground. He doesn't 
make the routine plays may look routine. So I think the Yankees might try to sell high on him and or Voight and, and try to reshape the infield a little bit. Yeah, I don't think those are bad moves at all. I feel the same way about Voight. I mean, ever since we got him, I know when we, we made that trade, it was like, who's Luke Voight? And then he comes in the rest of that year, and he really tore it up. Like He, he even looked good in the postseason that year, a little bit. I've always looked at him as streaky, though. He's streaky, and I, I'm not sold on him being like a long-term piece. So if you could sell, sell him now and get something for him because his value is as high as it's probably ever going to be. I don't see him matching this next year. Um, with that, I mean, listen, I, I'm a fan of Urshela, but if you can move him, you do have Andujar sitting there. So it's like a piece that you could move. I think it's time to move on from Brett Gardner. Move Clint Frazier up. Let the kid play every single day because you see the potential he has. Like, it actually annoys me how much they move him up and down. Like, he's a good player. Just let him play. If you give him more experience, more at-bats, he's going to get the feel for things. He was the second pick in the draft. Like, I think it was back in 2013. I mean, he's not, he's not some guy we just found off the streets. So, there are moves they have to make. Um, and, yeah, Sanchez, it's time to move on from him. I mean, he's just not the same guy we, he was a few years ago. We thought he was uh, going to be a bigger deal than he really ended up being because he came in so hot. And uh, I feel like the last time we really saw something big from him was like that 2017 season. I feel like ever since then, he's kind of been, eh. and I know I, I might be pushing it there, but to me, I feel that 2017 season, the next year we got Stanton, we looked at it as a three headed monster. You're going to have Sanchez judge and Stanton back to back to back right after each other, the home run hitters. Um, and I just don't feel like Sanchez ever really picked up on it. I look at him as lazy and there's rumors coming out that people, former ex, uh, well, ex-Yankee players came out and said that he was a problem as is. So now I'm going to say something as we kind of wrap up baseball talk, and I don't I don't want to panic anybody, but I want to make something clear. I think that this is the off season where the New York Yankees explore trade offers for Aaron Judge, and here's why: two years left on his contract. You're looking at his production on the field. Health wise, he's been an issue. Postseason, he was pathetic, pathetic. This past postseason, are you really willing to give him two hundred plus million dollars in a long term contract? Not this year, but next year when he's looking for it. I, I personally am not. You know, I love Judge. Don't get me wrong; I think he's great. But there are a lot of question marks, and if the Yankees could get a haul for him, especially in this trend of trying to change up the the culture a little bit, I think that anybody is available. A anybody. A Roldis Chapman, I think, could be available. Anybody not named DJ LeMahieu, if they re-sign him, could be available. But I think Judge might be the center of trade talks this offseason. That's a bold take. I mean, it's very possible, though. Listen, I'm a big Aaron Judge fan, too. But there are those fans who don't like him because he's kind of polarized. I feel like he's polarized. When you're, like, the face of the Yankees, you're either loved or you're hated. And um, the people who love him praise him. And they kind of have his back. And the people who don't like him trash him and say he's overrated. I think you can make a case for both. I think there is a piece of Aaron Judge that is a little overrated. And sometimes he's flat and there are the strikeouts and things like that. So I think that's just a, a decision that Cashman is going to have to make. It's not an easy decision. I think it depends on what you could get for him. And then you make the decision. If, if you kind of want to trade him away, but you're not, people aren't offering what you want, then you might kind of feel pressured into having to sign him into that type of deal. I think for us, we could just sit here and hope that he ends up stepping it up and he's worth that money, so we do keep him. Because I think we all want to keep him. You know, we don't want to get rid of Aaron Judge, but that's not up to us. It's up to Cashman. Cashman's made a lot of nice moves in his career, and he's he's also made some questionable ones. So um, we're just going to have to sit back and just hope for the best on that one. Yeah, with the whole luxury tax thing and, and looking at these guys, eventually you're going to have to pay these guys. and There's not enough to go around and if they want to compete maybe getting four or five players for an Aaron Judge may be the option you know if somebody comes in and says you know what we need a middle of the order bat we're going to give you two major league ready starting pitchers we're going to give you a major league ready caliber catcher and then two other prospects that you can grow upon I think it'd be very hard for the Yankees to say no especially given that right now you could pencil in Garrett Cole but nobody else into that rotation because like you said before Severino's not going to be back till June or July and Everybody else is basically a question mark. Now, let's get into football. First and foremost, I think we got to get into Dak Prescott. Very grueling injury on 
last Sunday's game against the Giants. He'll be out for the season with an ankle injury. Tough break for, for Dak considering his whole contract situation. We know that they've been in contract talks and nothing's really came to fruition. But now Dak finds himself in essentially a one-year deal. And now he has this injury to go along with it. Yeah, that was a gruesome injury. Uh, I've been talking a lot about polarizing figures today, right? Franchises, players. The Cowboys are a polarized franchise, right? And because of that, the quarterback of the Cowboys always gets a lot of attention. So there's people who, who think Prescott's the world, and there's other people who think he's, think he's overrated. I think there's three different ways to look at this. One way of looking at it is how do the Cowboys fare the rest of the of the year, right? Because most teams, when they lose their starting quarterback, they're in a bad spot. You look at the Jets last year. You look at um, the Steelers last year. Although they have a they had a great coaching staff to, to carry that team, a lot of backup quarterbacks aren't good in this league. But you look at Andy Dalton, and you're like, man, Andy Dalton's done some things in this league. He's not a he's not a he could like technically be a starter on some teams who are, I guess are looking to tank. But he has he has a nice supporting cast around him. So who knows if he could win some games and keep their season alive? Plus, how, do the, how does the rest of the NFC East play out now? Because that division's a mess as is. So even with Andy Dalton, they still might be able to make it to the playoffs. Like Whether it's an 8-8 eight and eight record or 7-9 and nine record, depends how the season plays out for them. I think the other way you have to look at it is, how are the Cowboys going to approach this now? Like, are they, now that after this year, you're not seeing the Dak Prescott for the rest of this year. He's gone after this year because he's on a franchise tag right now. Are they going to play the field? Are they going to look at free agency and see if any quarterbacks available? Are they going to see where they land in the draft where maybe one of these young quarterbacks uh, falls to them on the board? And then the other way to look at it is, do you think Dak Prescott gets screwed? Because I, I feel bad for the guy. In my opinion, I'm not a huge, huge fan of him, but you got to give credit where credit's due. The guy has played well. He has played well since the moment he took over in Dallas. He's made the playoffs about 50% of the times. Statistically, he's there. He was playing great this year. And he ended up signing that franchise tag deal where he got $31 million this year, but he's a free agent after this year. And he was fighting and fighting and fighting for that long-term deal, and now he gets hurt like this. So that's three different things I wanted to put out there. What do you th what's your opinion on the whole thing? Before I give you my opinion on it, you picked Dak to be your MVP, right? Yeah, it's not happening now. i got to change but now, it. I think I, but now i got to give you credit, you though, because if, if you looked at what Dak did up until he got hurt, you could make the case that he was a top three uh, MVP oh, yeah. caliber pick. Like, that's how good he was playing. Yeah. Like, people don't realize how good he was playing. So, in, in terms of that, yeah, he got hurt and kind of screwed your pick there. But that was a, a good pick considering how he was playing. Like, if you are if you would have had him for all 16, you could make the case that he could have been the MVP. Yeah, no doubt. I think the only thing that would have kept him off of, of winning the MVP is obviously some players like Russell Wilson are playing phenomenal right now, right? Josh Allen's playing great, too. No one's really talking about him. But I think what would hurt Dak in that situation is what's the record of the Cowboys? You know, if, if you finish 8-8, eight and eight, you're not winning MVP. I'm sorry. It's just not happening. Yeah, that is true, too. But a couple of things you mentioned I want to touch on. Number one, I do think Dak got screwed, but I do think that Dak got a little greedy. I, you know, and I say it about a lot of athletes. I think they're grossly overpaid. I, I think that over time, a lot of these guys – and, and, you know, Jamal Adams is another one. You know how much I love him, and I'll defend him as, as much as I can. But I think he got a little greedy, too. You know, they, these guys go for their money, and why? Because the NFL, and, you know, I'll credit the Augie Hoffman because he used to say it to me all the time, the NFL stands for not for long. So when you have that opportunity, get your money. And, you know, nobody's crying for Dak because he's making $30 million this year. Nobody feels bad for him. But, you know, looking forward, maybe Dallas tags him again. They have the option to tag him. It would be another... 30 plus if they decide, you know, give him a year and see what happens. But, you know, he might have lost out on hundreds of millions of dollars because he didn't take that contract offer that they were talking about early on because of finances, you know. So there is two sides to it. Yeah, you never wish ill on anybody, obviously. And, you know, I, I wish the best for Dak. But I think that these athletes should take this as notices, you know, not that not to say that if, if a team offers a contract, you have to snap your fingers and go, oh, man, I got to take this offer. That's not my case in point. My point is, you know, think about it in general in terms of your health and everything. You know, when you're talking about it, that next week, you might get hurt and never play again. Look at Ryan Shazier. Yeah. Nobody expected that. So I think that players need to be more cautious. I think that these owners need to be more cautious too. And, you know, I think that the greed is getting on both sides of the spectrum. 
So I have two questions for you. How do you think the Cowboys end up playing the rest of this year? Like playoffs or not playoffs? Also, what do you think the future is for Dak? Do you think he ends up in Dallas? Do you think he comes back as the same player? What's your take on that? All right, so Dallas, I w- I'm going to say they're a playoff team because the NFC East is so pathetic. I think they're an early out in the playoff. I don't think Andy Dalton really carries them. If Andy Dalton carries them to the Super Bowl, I'll dye my hair red. How's that? You know, we have this as a proof. So I'll dye my hair red. My, my parents might not like that. My boss might not like that. But you know what? It is what it is. I'll dye it for a week and I'll get rid of it. Now, the the other thing is I, Dak I don't think comes back anywhere near what he was. But I do think that his future right now is in Dallas. I think that that one-year tag they put him on, uh, they're going to see how he is. And then, you know, you can reevaluate over time. You can maybe trade for a quarterback. You can bring somebody in via the draft. It's going to all depend on how the rehab process goes. And I think that for the short term, you would have to think that Dallas is the likely destination for him. I don't know if you agree on that, but. Yeah, so uh, I think Dallas ends up playing pretty solid the rest of the rest of the year. I actually think they have a chance of making the playoffs over Philly because Philly's depleted, too. I mean, they're they're messed up. I mean, when they're completely healthy, they have a really nice roster, but they're just never healthy. And, and for some way or another, like, Carson Wentz finds a way to get this team to the postseason. But I think Dallas has a shot at making the playoffs. As for Dak, I think Dak does come back to Dallas. Um, and I think he actually comes back the same. And this is why. I like Dak Prescott. I think he plays hard. Um, he's a guy who's overcome a lot, of, a lot of adversity in his life. I believe his mother died of breast cancer when he was in college. He lost a brother to suicide earlier this year. Now he deals with this. Like, he's had a lot, and he's overcome a lot of it. He just has that mentality. Like, he's a humble guy. He, he has a good head on his shoulders. I feel like he, he puts in the work. Like, no one looked at him as that he would ever be in the position that he's in. He was like a third or fourth round pick. He came in and just – he works hard, and, and they talk about that all the time. And I think Jerry Jones respects that about him. And I think Jerry Jones is going to look at the situation and say, he's our quarterback. They're going to bring him back. And I think if – coincidentally in the same division if you see alex smith the quarterback of the washington football team come in after pos- almost having his leg amputated and he's getting sacked by aaron donald i think prescott's gonna be just fine coming back from this injury and i honestly i i, I wish him the best because like i said like i respect guys who are good he does a lot for the community you never hear a bad thing about him and you're, you're a quarterback of the dallas cowboys there's a lot of pressure on you the spotlight's on you so I, I wish him the best. And if he keeps the Giants out of the playoffs, I'm all for it. <laughs> I agree with you. Dak's a good guy. He's one of the, the few good guys in the NFL that you have, you know, that you can point out and say, you know, this is a great example for the league and whatnot. And you just hope he comes back healthy because obviously I like watching him play like you do. I think he's a humble guy. He works hard. So I hope he comes back and he tortures the Giants a little bit more uh, down the road. Now, the other topic we have to get into, and, and of course, you know, Everybody knows we're Jets fans, but the Jets made a stunning move, and I just want to touch briefly on it before our last topic of the night. The Jets cut Le'Veon Bell, the guy who was on pace to be the the league's best running back, got cut by the New York Jets. Oh my goodness! What was your reaction to that? I mean, it, I feel like I might contradict myself here, but it shocks me that they could do something so dumb. Like every decision they make is so bad that over time it doesn't shock me. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a shocking move, but then I look at it and it's like, oh my God. And you're like, you slap yourself and you're like, oh yeah, but it's a Jets. And you put your phone down. Like you're like not shocked (laughs) after a while by the the, the moves they make. So, um, but you know what? This is a prime example of, of Adam Gase. This is the power that he has on this team. Like seriously, this is the power he has. If he wants a player, and I don't know, he must be a great talker. I don't know if it's those eyes. They, he must, like, hypnotize people into, like, just believing what he says because he did the same thing in Miami. He alienates players. He has them traded. Jarvis Landry, Ryan Tannehill, Kenyon Drake, Jay Ajayi. Like, the list goes on. Like, it's actually a joke. And now with this, we get rid of Jamal. We get rid of Le'Veon. It's almost like, and I said this in the past. I don't know if it's it was on this podcast, but – I've said this in the past. It's like he, and I've said this to you, it's like he enjoys getting rid of talent so that he could use the excuse that they need more time to build. It's like with talent, you know, the pressure's on you. Like, how are you not getting the most out of this player? 
He likes sitting there having no one. So the excuse, because there's actually people out there saying, well, he's not working with much. Are you kidding me? You ruined Le'Veon Bell, which is like, it's, it's impossible. But you made it possible. And all the players that this guy has that are talented, that don't like him and they speak up to him, and they're against the way he coaches and against his leadership, he gets rid of them. And then they go elsewhere and they become superstars. Ryan Tannehill is 4-0 and right now. Looks like an MVP candidate. Miami traded him away by also offering $5 million just so someone would take him. Kenya Drake, Minka Fitzpatrick, all of them. So, you know what? That's a typical Jets move. I wish Le'Veon the best. I hope Kansas City goes and wins the Super Bowl. And I hope that Kansas City puts up 70 on the Jets. I hope it's the biggest spread you've ever seen. And I hope that they surpass that. <laughs> Team's a joke. I hope they don't win a game. I really hope they don't win a game. So, Listen, I have no reason to watch the Jets anymore. I really don't. First of all, I wish Le'Veon the best. I love him. Now, Le'Veon, can you do me a favor? Write a diss track about the Jets, please. You wrote one about the Steelers. The Jets did you dirty. Write one about Joe Douglas and Adam Gase. Please. And all I want this to show is that the media listens to Joe Douglas. And when Joe Douglas wants somebody to look bad, Joe Douglas makes them look bad. Jamal happened. They made him out to be public enemy number one. But all of a sudden, they can't trade Le'Veon Bell for a bag of chips. And now Jamal looks like an angel. Like, yeah, this is what I've been trying to tell you people for months. Jamal wasn't the problem. If you didn't want to sign him... Be honest. Be upfront. Don't lie to the guy and then come out to the media and tell a different story. Don't contradict yourself, Joe. Joe, you made this team even worse than it was. This is embarrassing. And the coach, how is Adam Gase still employed? That's embarrassing. He shouldn't even have a job in the NFL. The guy can't even make Le'Veon Bell productive. Yeah. Like, listen, I could go to any any football team in the country. I could go to every single Pee Wee football league. I could go to every single high school football coach. I could go to any college coach. I could go to any NFL coach. I could go to the CFL, the XFL, whatever you want to call them. And I could not find one other coach that would say, honestly, that they didn't want Le'Veon Bell on their team. Just Adam Gase. Just Adam Gase. <laughs> I think anyone in their right mind would think that Adam Gase is the problem, or Joe Douglas, and it's not Jamal Adams and Le'Veon Bell. Like, Jamal Adams and Le'Veon Bell, first off, were your best players with years to go still in their career. They're calling your organization out, the ownership, the management, the coaching staff, the culture, because it's complete garbage, and you don't want to hear them. You don't want them speaking the truth, so you get rid of them. And I know you. I mentioned Adam Gase. I didn't mention Joe Douglas earlier, and then you mentioned. Him. So now that we mentioned Joe Douglas, there's, and this sounds crazy, but there's still that part of me that has some faith in him, and that's why I haven't completely attacked him yet. But it's this off season. It's what the Jets do this off season because there's all this talk. Let's tank, right? Let's see if they get that top pick. Let's see what they do with that top pick. Let's see what they do with all this cap space and the draft picks. If he doesn't hit on this, I'm done with him. I'm giving him this year. I want to be impressed by the moves that he makes and the product that they put on the field next year. If if he doesn't do it, I'm done with him, and I'm pretty much done with the organization because at this point, like, I I've watched the Jets for years now. I've never seen it this bad. And the only reason that I'm completely content with the direction that it's going in is because, and you know, I want Trevor Lawrence, and I don't think Trevor Lawrence is single-handedly going to come in and change this organization, but I just want him. So if there's anything to look forward to as a Jets fan for me, it's that. But if you're telling me that if they, they came out right now and said, listen, Sam's our future, we're not drafting Trevor Lawrence, see ya, I, I'm out of here. I, I will watch football to watch football, but I will not support this organization. And I think Jets fans, this might sound dramatic, but it's kind of the truth. If you're a Jets fan, you understand. Stop buying the tickets to these to these games. Don't, And I know they can't do it this year, but in the future, don't go to the games. Don't buy the jerseys. Boycott them. Boycott them because maybe the ownership then will be like, wow, we can't screw over these people anymore. Because that's all they're doing. They're walking right over these fans, and the fans go out and they still – they give their hard-earned money to – or they pay their hard-earned money to watch this garbage and to buy – that's the only reason the Jets changed their uniforms last year. It's money. They didn't need to change their uniforms. These uniforms are worse than what we had. Now, I could go on, I could go on and on, but I'm, I'm just going to stop here because we have other things to, to mention after this. Here's my public mention, and I'm going to keep this record because I, I, I'm 
I'm not going to boast that I'm right, because, but I'm, I can tell the future, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, okay? As much as you guys want Trevor Lawrence, as much as they say Trevor Lawrence is a savior, the second coming, you know, whatever they want to call him, Trevor Lawrence won't be a Jet more than three years. Why? Joe Douglas is the worst GM in football. Joe Douglas does not know how to organize a team. Look at what he did this offseason. He brought in a bunch of no-names, overpaid these no-names, and they're pathetic. George Fant, you mean to tell me that the worst-rated offensive lineman, according to Pro Football Focus, is your starting right tackle? You mean to tell me that Connor McGovern, McDermott, these no-name scrubs, Brashawn Perryman, look what happened when Robbie Anderson got away from, from Adam Gase. He's the top-five receiver in the league right now. I feel bad for Sam yeah. Donald. I think he gets so much garbage, and I, I know he makes mistakes that, that rookies make. I totally get that. But look at what he's dealing with. Like, and There was a point in time during the season that I couldn't name any of his receivers other than Hogan because Hogan had the big run oh, yeah. in the Super Bowl. I couldn't name the Smith boys or, or the other scrubs they had out there. He had not one NFL-capable weapon to help him and then when he does get his weapon back and he's not even on the field because he's hurt because the line's atrocious including Mekhi Becton who's not very good they, they Le'Veon Bell doesn't touch the ball he's like 13 carries or 14 carries and they don't use him right so but I'll run I'll run Frank yeah Gore. Frank Gore 12 times 13 times a day at 38 years old but my thing is this Trevor Lawrence is doomed if he gets drafted by the New York Jets and I personally feel bad for him I do, because he's going into a no-win situation. They had $40 million in cap this year. They failed to spend because Joe Douglas was cheap and the Johnsons were cheap. You mean to tell me they're going to overpay for free agents? And they're going to have to because everybody knows how bad the culture is. Like, you're not going to bring in a new head coach and people are going to be like, oh, yeah, the culture's changed. It's same, it's same owner, same GM. You know, nothing's changed. It's just the guy in charge. It's the same repetitive cycle. And yet another rookie quarterback is going to come in and everybody's going to put the pressure on him that he's the next coming and it's not going to work out. So I apologize to Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, or Trey Lance, whoever becomes the next Jets quarterback. Um, I apologize. I do. Because you're joining an exclusive club that cannot be changed. They're losers forever. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about that. The last the last comment you made is a fact. It's not an opinion. It's a fact. <laughs> but I truly believe that the only reason Adam Gase is still the head coach is because Joe Douglas knows that the best chance of them possibly going winless is with Adam Gase as the head coach. You can I, Listen, this roster is horrible. I'm not sure a, a coach can win with this roster. Or I should just say team. But Greg Williams – kind of turn that Cleveland team around a few years ago as an interim head coach. What do you get out of this season if you bring him in and they start winning games? If you're a Jets fan, whether you want Trevor Lawrence or not, the it, like the best thing you could do is hope for the Jets to lose. Because even in your case, right, you don't want Trevor Lawrence. But you should still want the Jets to get the first pick because if there is the chance of them trading out of there, you know how much you're going to get in return for that? Like Whether you want Trevor Lawrence or not, if the Jets take Trevor Lawrence number one or they pass on him, which if they do, like I said, see you later. I'll move to another state. But you still could get so much in return for him. So moving anywhere out of that top spot is, is pointless at this point. So that's why they're keeping Adam Gase. I also think in typical Jets fashion, this is what's going to happen. If Kyle wants Trevor Lawrence, Kyle doesn't get Trevor Lawrence. It's like that's just what happens. So what the Jets will do is they're either going to get that top pick and trade it away or like that's, that's – uh, Point A. Point B would be that they they win a game or two and move themselves out of that spot. Or three, the Giants get the first pick and you watch Trevor Lawrence in our stadium for the next 20 years tearing it up while we sit there with Sammy D for another year and then drafting some kid at Norfolk State the next year. So it's whatever. <laughs> There's enough Jets talk for today. we got to talk about some other winless teams. Wait, you just went into the third person, which made it even better. Yeah. You were like, Kyle yeah. wants Trevor Lawrence. Kyle doesn't get Trevor Lawrence. That was great. That just made my evening. Like, no joke. Now, <laughs> our final topic of the day. We have two sides to this. Number one, there's three teams that are 0-5. And, and funny thing, they're the teams that my family follows. The Atlanta Falcons, yeah. my sister's team. The New York Jets that we mentioned, mine and my mom's team. And the New York Giants, my father's team. Who goes winless? Who has the best chance of going win winless? Listen, I'm not even just 
saying this because I'm a Jets fan. I think the Jets have the best chance to go winless. I think there's maybe three games they have a chance of winning this year. And the only reason I say <laughs> the only reason I say that is because listen, when you're looking at them versus Kansas City and Seattle and Cleveland and Buffalo and New England, they have no chance. I don't even care if Patrick Mahomes plays. They're still gonna lose that game. So I think Travis Kelsey was like a, a quarterback in like high school or something like that. He could beat the Jets. So they have no chance of winning those games. So when you look at the other games, you look at Miami twice, you look at maybe LA, you think to yourself, I still think the Jets are, are the underdog in that game, but you just never know, right? Let's say Miami benches Fitzpatrick in a few weeks and it's Tua. We don't know what to expect of Tua. So who knows if the Jets can win a game there? So I think the Jets have uh, the best shot of going winless. What do you think? I think that the Giants have the best chance of going winless because, like you said, I'm going to throw I'm going to throw a Kyle third person. Kyle wants them to go winless. Kyle's right. not going to get that. I think they beat Miami once. I, I I do. I just have a weird feeling about it. I think if any week is to do it, it's going to be this week. Why? They're getting back Perryman. They're getting back a couple of guys that can be an impact. And you know Adam Gase is going to find ways to open a playbook. He's going to get rid of the little Madden one he had for Sam Darnold. He's going to use a different playbook for Joe Flacco, and they're going to win a game. It's going to be ugly, but they're going to win a football game. And then we'll have another Kyle reaction where in the third person you'll be like, I'm not getting Trevor Lawrence. But I would say Giants because I think that they lose to Washington this week. I think that all hope just goes down the tube. And then I think Atlanta is the best team of the three. I think them being 0-5 yeah. is shocking. Yeah. To be honest with you, I think Atlanta being uh, – Atlanta's definitely the best out of those three. Um, I'm shocked they're 0-5. And we know that they really shouldn't be 0-5. They just collapsed in some of those games. I mean, they easily could have two wins by now. You can even make the case for three. The thing is – and listen, I'm not a Giants fan, but I think this is something Giants fans should start thinking about. There's a lot of trash talk about the Jets, right? The Giants have a better roster than the Jets. So how is the attention not being put on Joe Judge? I get it's his first year, but dude, 0-5 with that roster? Come on, dude. Plus, secondly, you versed Dallas when their quarterback went down. You still couldn't win the game. It's just like some of the pressure's got to be starting to put on Aaron, uh, Aaron Judge. Joe Judge. Like, it's actually a joke at this point. But I do look at uh, ahead at the schedule, and I do think that new, like the Giants have a better chance of maybe pulling off uh, more wins than the Jets because – Listen, they do versus Washington twice, right? And, and Washington's not a good football team. It's completely up for grabs, that game. They still versus Dallas once more. Who knows? They, they played them tough even with Dak. They couldn't pull, pull off a win, but still. And they still versus Philadelphia, who's not a good team right now. And there's a few other teams. So um, I actually wrote it down. I think this is, sounds crazy, but I think when you look at their schedule, they have a possibility. I'm not saying they're going to, but they, they might have a possibility of competing in like at least six more games. Competing. And when you compete, you never know what could happen. But seriously, if you look at their schedule, they have some really, really easy games out there if they just play well. They're not going to win six, but, you know. Yeah, that would be too much of a shocker for us. But yeah, I think no. it's safe to say that both teams are pathetic. If they both if they both combine for one or two wins this year, wouldn't it be surprising? Now, now let's, let's look at the unbeatens. There's four left. Kansas City lost last week to the, to the Raiders. You have Seattle, Green Bay, Pittsburgh, and Tennessee. You got two in each conference, which of those four teams do you think has the best chance of going 16-0? and That's tough. I mean, I think when you look at division, Green Bay, right? Because, like, Chicago doesn't really impress me. I'm not sold on Foles. And then Minnesota and Detroit have looked pathetic. But I think the – I like Seattle. I always have. I've always loved Russ and Pete Carroll. Now they have Adams. But Seattle's not in an easy division. Like, they're, they're going to have to verse L.A. They're going to have to verse Arizona. Who knows what San Fran could pull off? I mean, they're a well-coached team. But I'm going to – I don't think anyone's going undefeated. But I'll, I'll just say Seattle just based on the fact that I like them. And I, that'd be a team I'd actually be rooting for to go 16-0 at some point. But that also kind of hurts the Jets, right, because we have their first-round pick. So, you know. If Kyle wants a good, if Kyle wants a good draft pick, Kyle doesn't get a good draft pick. We're gonna have to make shirts that say this. If Kyle wants, <laughs> and then on the back it says Kyle doesn't get, and then put the logo right underneath oh. it. And that, that might be a good holiday oh, gift for everybody. You know, if Kyle wants, Kyle doesn't get it. But or you could just we could just put all of us all of us in the same category. You could put Jets fans. If Jets fans want, that's something the Jets should do because it, look at the years of oh we need a win. 
the Jets don't get a win. We want this player. The Jets don't get that player. We want this coach. They don't get that coach. So it's all you a just bunch fall of ifs. It. But if you're looking at strength of schedule, you got to say Green Bay's got the best chance. I think they got the Bears twice, which are no easy games. But then they, the only two games that really stood out to me on the schedule were Tampa Bay and Tennessee. If you look at Seattle's schedule, Seattle's got the Bills on the road. They got the Cardinals twice, Rams twice. You mentioned that division. It's kind of tough. They got the 49ers twice still, uh, too. But then they get, like, the Jets, Washington, the Giants, Philly. So if they could get past that tough part, they could be a team, and especially the way Wilson's playing. I think if you had to rank them, it would be one and two. And the two teams in the AFC I don't think go out. Uh, Unbeaten. I think Pittsburgh loses to Baltimore in the second matchup or one of the two matchups. And then Tennessee loses to Baltimore as well. I think that there'll be a upset special there. So let's have our Kyle final thoughts of the day. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, we mentioned LeBron earlier on in the show. Happy about that. At least one of my guys won something and I have something to be happy about. Yankees were a complete disappointment. The Jets, I find myself in this position around week five, week six every year, and that's just hoping for the first pick in the draft. And this year more than any other year. Um, so if just know on uh, whether it's a Sunday, a Monday, or Thursday night, if the Jets are playing, I'm rooting against them. Uh, that's just how it is. What's your take on it? Yeah, I have to agree with you on there. You know, first and foremost, the, uh, the Jets are atrocious. LeBron deserved the title, regardless of what people say. Uh, the Yankees are a disappointment. Hopefully they make some moves this offseason. And I have to admit, last Sunday I did not watch one single snap of the New York Jets game. I plan on doing the same thing this week. And, you know, it should be good. But we're going to wrap it up for today's show. This has been another episode of the Let's Debate Podcast powered by Dell and Media. We'll be back next week, our normal slot, Thursday nights, 8 o'clock. So make sure you tune in. We'll have a lot more sports to talk about with you. Until next time, that's Kyle Delahanty. I'm Nick Delahanty, and we're wrapping up here on the Let's Debate podcast. All right, guys, catch you next week.